So we can start the Q&A session. If you raise your hands, and there, there are microphones going around, yes. They'll, take, get, they'll give the microphone to you. The, 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 gentle, the yeah, gentleman right next to you. Yeah. Please keep your questions to the point. And let's see how it goes. Upon the attainment of permanent liberation, who is obtaining? All right, that's a very subtle question and a difficult one. You see, the, the question, if you got it, was this attainment of liberation. Who attains liberation? If you ask that question. You know why it's difficult? Because, if you put it this way, if the ultimate reality is Brahman, one existence consciousness bliss, that's ever liberated. Right? And then we, we are that Brahman. So we can't say that I get liberated. We can't say that Brahman gets liberated. Body does not get liberated. Mind does not get liberated. In fact, even the person does not get liberated. Ashtavakra says that you become, it's not that the person will become free. You become free of the person. So the question remains then, who gets liberated? In um, Shankaracharya's commentaries, is, for example, in the Bhagavad Gita, 13th chapter, 2nd verse, there's a long commentary. After a long and subtle discussion, this question is asked, who gets liberated in that case? Brahman doesn't need liberation. And I am Brahman, so I don't need liberation either. Shankaracharya asks there, why are you asking? Very interesting. The precise way the question is put is, who has ignorance? Who has ignorance? Brahman cannot have ignorance. And I am Brahman also. So I also cannot have ignorance. And who has ignorance? Whose ignorance is removed by Vedanta? And Shankaracharya asks, there's a very interesting reply. He says, in, he asks a counter question. Why are you asking this question? And then the person says, because I don't know, I'm asking. And Shankaracharya says, therefore you have got ignorance. You just said you don't know. But I am Brahman. Shankaracharya says, do you know that? He said, no. In that case, you've got ignorance. You know why this paradox is there? The paradox is there because the individual, the jiva, is an illusory state. It's not a real thing with some real problem. The real thing only is Brahman. It has no problems at all. Therefore, this state of uncertainty, this state of inconsistency will remain. Only when you get liberated, what will happen is, you will see that I was never in bondage. So the question, if you ask, who was in bondage, who gets liberated, finally is rendered moot. The problem will not be solved, it just will be dissolved. See it from the point perspective of Brahman, you begin to see what has happened. Yeah. All right. Could you pass the microphone there? Yeah. To you, then, and then to him. Uh, person, uh, yeah, person, yeah, then hello. Him. Yeah, you have already partly answered my question, but uh, my question goes a little bit further. And the question is that as a spiritual practice, we spend our life, you know, we all have the body keeps asserting itself. I'm hungry, feed me. And then either you listen to that assertion. Or, so how does the pure consciousness assert itself? Of course, you know, it doesn't need any assertion. But in the practice of spiritual practice, uh, in, the pra in the practice of the question of developing a new habit, then where does that habit reside? You know, habits can only reside in the mind. So as a practice, does it become a practice of negation, saying, telling the body, oh, assert it, if it's asserting itself, you say, oh, go away, you know, as a practice, not as a theoretical question, but as a practice. Is it become a practice of negation? Because there is no need for positive assertion. Do you, have, do you have a specific question? Make your question precise. I understand where you're going with this, but can you state it more precisely? No, I'm interested more in the practice of it. So the practice, is it the practice of negation, of assertion, assertion of 
body, for example, or is it a, some positive practice? That's the question. All right. The question of practice. You see, one thing has to be understood. It is not that there are two things, one pure consciousness and the rest world, body, mind. It seems like that when you hear what I said, separate the body from yourself and abide in pure consciousness. As if there is a body, mind and pure consciousness. You know what it's like? It's like telling a wave in the ocean out there in the Pacific that you separate yourself from the wave and abide as water. It's not that there are two things, a wave and water. No. It's the same thing, water itself, which appears and functions as a wave for a while. While it is a wave, it's still water, very much water, nothing other than water. All we are asking the wave to do is go on being a wave, no, no problem. Recognize in truth you are, you were, and you will be only water. You are pure consciousness. What about the body and the mind and the world? Note something. All of these are experienced in pure consciousness. I'm going to ask you to think carefully about one point. When can you say two things are separate? When can you say two things are separate? Practically, you can say that two things are separate if you can show them or experience them separately. I can tell you the lamp and the microphone are separate when I can show you the lamp separately and the microphone separately. You can experience them separately. You can experience them together also, but you experience them separately. Another example is somebody has got dentures or real teeth. You never know whether those are real teeth or dentures until you see them separately, the person and the dentures. Then you say, oh, okay, they are two different entities. But if you always see them together, you have no way of seeing that they are separate. You have no justification. Where am I going with this? Pure consciousness and the universe, body, mind, and everything else are like that. You can never show them separately. Think about it. All your experience of world, body, mind, can you ever experience them apart from consciousness? Or are they always experienced in consciousness? I'm asking you to think in this way, that it's first of all helpful sometimes to think of consciousness like a light which shines upon the room. It's helpful to think like that, but that's not what is meant. What is meant is consciousness is like water which appears as so many waves and bubbles and foam as the gold which appears as so many ornaments, as the wood which appears as so many kinds of wooden furniture. Even while it is furniture, it's still wood. Even while it is a wave or a bubble or foam or whatever, it's still water. Even when it's a gold bangle or a necklace or a crown or a ring, it's still the same gold or not changed at all. What has changed is the name and the form and the function. I'm trying to answer your first question is, how do you deal with the body when it asserts itself? Do you say, no, I will not feed you. Be hungry. I am pure consciousness. <laughs> there is a fundamental uh, misunderstanding there. It's as if the body is something different which has caught me and made me a prisoner, but I am actually pure consciousness, spirit or whatever, and I shall fly free of you, the body. It's like the water telling the wave, I don't want to be a wave. You wave, get out from here. I will be water. <laughs> the wave is nothing other than you. This is a deep, deeper thing to understand. When, I, when Ashtabhakra says, separate yourself from the body, he does not mean two real things being separated. He just says, what you thought of as the world, body and mind are in reality, in knowledge, only pure consciousness. They are all names and forms and functions in pure consciousness. That is the basis of the answer. Now, practically to your answer. If the body is hungry, feed it. Feed it. There's no problem. 
knowing that the the bench is made of wood does it prevent you from sitting on the bench no yeah. knowing that the world is pure consciousness only does it prevent you from vyavahara which is called in sanskrit vyavahara no usage empirical usage will continue did the enlightened persons eat oh yes they did sometimes more than us <laughs> they had hearty appetites many of them there's nothing wrong in it annam brahma vidya jana upanishad says no food alone to be brahman how can food be brahman food not as food as a existence consciousness bliss appearing as food i'll give you another thing just think about it shankaracharya sings in a nirvana shatakam na bhojyam na bhokta na bhojanam na bhojanam na bhojyam na bhokta chidananda roopa shivoham i am not the food i am not the eater i am not the eating i am pure consciousness and bliss one contrast this with every day when we go to eat something we chant brahmaarpanam brahmavi brahmagno brahmanahutam brahmeva te nagantavyam brahma karma samadhina that's the prayer which we chant every time when we go to eat in our monasteries you know what it means it means the the ladle with which you eat you no know, the, the spoon is brahman the food which you eat is brahman the fire of hunger into which you offer the food is brahman the one who eats is brahman that which is eaten is brahman this very action of eating is brahman the one who sees brahman in every action attains brahman now if you put them together don't they seem diametrically opposite in one you said i am not the food i am not the eater i am not the eating i am brahman in the other one you say the food is brahman the eating is brahman the eater is brahman are they opposite or are they saying the same thing if you understand they are saying the same thing you have understood advaita vedanta <laughs> <laughs> truly one of our the masters in the himalayas he said something very interesting then somebody says this is a mass of contradictions often in the language of paradox is used contradictions and the master replied and i'm it's not a story i mean actually i heard him say that he said in hindi jab do vipareet baat ek saath samajh mein aayegi tab advait pakad mein aavegi when two absolutely contradictory things are understood to be perfectly reasonable then you have understood advaita imagine um there's a whole old tamil story about a little boy who went with his father to the museum where there is a wooden elephant it's a story of the alvars i think a wooden elephant and the boy gets so scared he hides behind the dhoti of his father and speaks out and the father says it's not an elephant it's just wood now if you say because the boy the boy didn't recognize the wood nature of the elephant and thought it was a real elephant and the father recognizes the wood nature of the elephant and knows that it's just a make believe elephant now if i say to you it's not an elephant it's wood that's correct if i say the wood is no, the elephant is nothing but wood also correct it's wood not an elephant correct the elephant is wood that's also correct you mistake the classic vedantic example you mistake a rope for a snake there are two ways of dealing with it one way you can say that it's not a rope it's not a snake it's a rope one or you can say the snake is a rope true correct you can say uh, the food is not brahman the eater is not brahman uh, the eating is not brahman only brahman exists correct or you can say brahman is the food the eater and the eating correct <coughs> now practice is it good for the body to sit still and not fidget yes as a body certainly is it good for the mind to dwell on om or on god or meditate yes is it good to believe in god and and worship and um, 
Yes, why not? At the level of appearance, at the level of appearance, what you are asking is, in terms of the wooden furniture, you are asking is, um, should the chair be rejected and only the wood taken? My answer is no. Understand that it is only wood and use a chair as a chair, a table as a cha table. There's nothing wrong in it. There's no, it's not contradictory. When Ashtavakra says, separate yourself from the body, what he is telling is, separate the wood from the table. What, it does not mean that there is a table and there is something called wood. And the two are enemies. No. Mm -hmm. Understand the table to be wood. Understand the water to be, uh, the wave to be water. Understand the ornament to be gold. Then all the actions that were happening earlier, the business of life can continue, but you will continue in peace and joy and serenity. Did, and you asked about practice. There's a whole science of practice. I can go into that, but that's not Ash that's from Ashtavakra's point of view. That's kindergarten stuff. But that does not mean it's useless. It is useful. It's useful to keep the body as a body in life. It's useful to keep the mind as a mind in line. It's much better for the mind to meditate than not to meditate. It's much better for the body to do yoga asanas and then not to do yoga asanas. It's much better to have rhythmic and deep breathing than shallow and chaotic breathing. But remember, none of them are going to make you Brahman. You are Brahman already. What Ashtamakra says, just recognize that. Try to understand that. Once you've understood it, if you practice, well and good. If you don't practice, you don't need it also. But at the level of the body and mind, the consequences will be felt. The benefits of practice will come to you. If you practice and if you do not practice, the benefits of practice will not come to you at the level of body and mind. At the level of reality, you are always Brahman. Question. Um, my question was, um, you said you're not the body, you're not the mind, you're the witness. Yes. But are we not limit, still limited to the body and the mind? And the situations and the memories and all that stuff still, even though we are not that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a contradiction. I, I feel it as a contradiction. All right. What I mean by not being the body and mind and how are we not limited to being the body and mind, it's like this. When you are awake, to you the pure consciousness, this mind and this body and its life presents itself. And things keep happening. And you lead your life. Ups and downs in life continue. The moment you fall asleep and go into your dreams, then this body disappears from the awareness. This particular life disappears from the awareness. Based on waking experiences, dreams are generated. The pure con consciousness continues to generate, continues to experience the dreams. When you go into deep sleep, the mind shuts down. So no experience of body, no experience of dreams, just the blankness and absence. The pure consciousness continues to experience that. The blankness and absence of deep sleep. And again the mind wakes up. And waking world. Now, the pure consciousness is not limited by any of this. It's free of the waking. It's free of the dreaming. It's free of the deep sleep. Therefore, it can easily move in and out of these states. You see? The pure consciousness is not limited by, by your... It, it, it illumines the presence of your waking life. It illumines the absence of your waking life. And hence, it's free. You are free of the particular life. You think you're bound. I am not the body and mind, yet I seem to be bound by the circumstances of the body and mind. No. You think that you're bound by the circumstances of the body and mind because you think you are some kind of consciousness, a spark of consciousness in this body and mind. Rather, reverse it. You are the field of consciousness, a field of light in which the body and mind occasionally appear and do their thing. You are no longer, no more limited to the body and mind than even, suppose, this light example. This light is not stuck to any of us. It illumines all of us when we are present. When we leave the hall, it still illumines the empty hall. It's free of us. Every happening in your life, every person in your life, including your body, your mind, your cherished aspirations, your personal history, all of them appear in consciousness, depend on that consciousness, 
and disappear back into that consciousness. Mm-hmm. That consciousness is not affected by anything. It's free of all of that. But they in turn, they are not free of you. They depend on you. They cannot exist without you. You see, this is the play of Maya. We feel we are limited by the body and mind. We are stuck to them. It's the other way around. We are completely free of this life. But this life depends on us. The projector on which the movie plays, the the screen, the screen is completely free of the movie. The villain in the movie does not make the screen villainous. The hero in the movie does not make the um, screen heroic. The disasters in the movie, an inferno does not burn up the skin, the screen, uh, an earthquake does not split the screen, uh, a deluge does not wet the screen. I'm almost literally translating Shankaracharya actually. <laughs> he does not talk about a movie, he talks about the water of a mirage does not wet a single grain of the desert, so a single grain of sand in the desert. That which is false cannot affect the real. So the screen is free of the happenings of the movie. It's not touched. Sanskrit word is asanga. It's completely untouched by what's happening on it. Yet, the movie is totally dependent on the screen. Without the screen, no movie is possible. The world, the universe, and you yourself, your body, and your life are completely dependent on you, the pure consciousness. You, the pure consciousness, on the other hand, are not at all in the slightest bit limited by the the life of the person. You are free of the person. The person cannot be free of you because the person has no existence apart from you. Think about your dream. You in your dream and all the things that are happening in the dream, the nightmare. You say, I'm trapped. No. You are generating the dream every bit. The tiger that's chasing you through a forest in the dream. You say, I'm suffering, I'm trapped in these circumstances. No, the truth is, you the dreamer, you have generated the tiger, the forest, and the scared person running through the forest. All of them depend on you, the mind of the dreamer. They all depend upon you. You don't depend upon any of them. You are free of all of them. The moment you stop dreaming them, they go out of existence. This life is like that. Enjoy the life. Ashtavakra says, you don't have to run away from life. Enjoy life. Live in great joy. It is the beginner who's scared of life. Steps back. Oh, this is terrible. This is, I'll do only sit and meditate and keep the world out of my mind. Don't keep the world out of your mind. The world is you. There's nothing in the world apart from you. Why should you be afraid? Alan, Alan, Watts, who, Alan Watts, whom I quoted, he tells it so beautifully. He says, You know what the secret of the universe is? It's best told as a little story. He says, I often find children get it immediately, adults a little, (laughs) takes a little longer. (laughs) What's the story? He said, God only exists. He's telling children, you know, God only exists. But after some time, God got all lonesome. I'll be alone, you know. So God wanted to play. God wanted to play hide and seek. But whom will he play with? Because God only exists. Then God hit upon a clever plan. God pretended not to be God. How? He pretended to be you and me and him and her. Even the plant and the animal and the birds. God pretended to be the sky and the fire and the earth and the oceans. God pretended to be not God. And merrily began a game of hide and seek with himself. But God being God is very good at what he does. He was so good at pretending not to be himself that he forgot himself. (laughs) And that got him into trouble. Now God thinks that he is you and me and him and her and limited by this terrible life and suffering. God is now trying to find himself. God must be reintroduced to himself. That's what Ashtavakra does. He's re- reintroducing God to himself. Okay, question. Hello. Two statements. 
Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma. Yes. Sat Chit Ananda. Yes. Hek make a comment on this. How one, is, are there two different statements or one statement? One Swarupa Lakshanam, two Swarupa Lakshanams? Yeah. All right, that's a technical question. What he asked was, in the Taittiriya Upanishad, one of the Upanishads, Brahman is defined. If you ask, what is Brahman? Please define it. It's defined as, Brahman is infinite existence consciousness. Satyam, existence or reality. Jnanam, knowledge or consciousness. Anantam, without limit. That is Brahman. Another definition of Brahman is Sat Chit Ananda. Pure existence, pure consciousness, pure bliss. They are almost similar. But there is a slight difference. Here you have used the word infinity. There you have used the word Ananda, bliss. So are they two different uh, definitions? He also used the technical term Swarupa Lakshanam. This person who has been doing a lot of Vedantic study. There are two ways of defining Brahman. Two ways of defining Brahman. One is a direct definition. One is an indirect definition. What is a direct definition? Direct definition is God is infinite exist or Brahman is infinite existence consciousness. Or consciousness existence bliss is Brahman. This is called direct definition. Definition of Brahman as is. In its own nature. Swarupa means own nature. In its own reality. But the problem with this definition is it's awfully abstract, at least to a beginner. What do you mean infinite existence consciousness? It doesn't seem to have anything to do with me or you or the, this room or this, this sky and earth and plants and flowers. It seems something remote and abstract. So the Upanishadic teachers hit upon Another way of defining Brahman which will make us more comfortable. An indirect way. It's called Tatastha, literally meaning standing on the bank. So, an indirect way of defining Brahman. What's it like? It's like this. Suppose you're going to the apartments out there in Orange County and you're... And they're all cookie cutter houses, you know, they all look alike. <laughs> and then your friend asks you, which one is yours? And you point out in the distance, that one. Which one? That one on which the crow is sitting, that one is mine. Okay, the crow is sitting on the, that's yours. Now the crow is not a part of your house. It just happens to be sitting there incidentally for that time being. It can now fly away. It's done its job of pointing out your house to your friend. <laughs> you use the crow, an incidental thing, to point out what your friend was asking. Now you do, you can, can you do that to Brahman? Yes. When you say, Brahman is that from which the world emerges, that in which the world exists, that in which the world disappears finally. You are helping me now because I know the world. You mean this world? Yeah, this world. You mean me? Yes, you. All of this. That from which all of this has come, in which it exists, into which it will finally disappear. Know that to be Brahman. Here, this world, the universe is the crow. It has really got nothing to do with Brahman. There's no universe at all according to Advaita. But because it appears, you can see it, it's being used to indicate Brahman. When you realize Brahman, you'll see there's no universe at all. It's Brahman only. It's called an indirect definition. So he's asking, are there two direct definitions? Existence consciousness bliss and infinite existence consciousness? Well, actually, there are not. It's one, one definition but uh, put in two different ways and I'll cut it short. The link between the two definitions is this. One definition is infinite existence consciousness. Satyam Jnanam Ananda. The other one is Satchid Ananda. Now, Satyam and Jnanam, existence and consciousness are the same, Satchid. Ananda and Anantam are the same. How? Infinity and bliss are the same. How? In the Chandogya Upanishad it is said, Nalpe sukhamasti. There is no happiness in the limited. Yo vai bhuma tat sukham. That which is the infinite, the vast, that alone is ha the happiness. Our search for happiness knows no bounds until you are one with the universe, until you are one with infinity, you, are, you have it all. Until that time, you cannot stop searching for happiness. Happiness and infinity. Happiness and limitlessness are 
one and the same. Limitlessness again is another name for freedom, moksha. True happiness is equal to limitlessness is equal to freedom. We will not stop on this side of Maya. We must go beyond Maya to attain freedom. That alone is happiness. Somebody once asked me when I became a monk, I don't know how I was so wise beyond my years at that time. Somebody asked me, oh, you're giving it all up to be a monk. I said, no, 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 I'm not being a monk to give it all up. I am being a monk because I'm not satisfied with a few things. I want everything, the whole universe. <laughs> Questions? We we'll have to work, work our way backwards there. Yeah. I'll come back. Uh, so it's a privilege to uh, listen to you in person. Thank you. Uh, so I heard uh, stories of Ramakrishna Paramahams that uh, he has uh, given the experience directly to Vivekananda by touching or by some way. So uh, my question is, so is it really uh, necessary to uh, uh, understand Vedanta and Upanishad and truth nature of it? If the experience can be given directly and by that experience, knowledge will, <coughs> knowledge will come? Yes. Um, the straight answer is you need a guru like Vive, uh, Ramakrishna and a student like Vivekananda. <laughs> <laughs> One of our swamis, he was giving mantra diksha, initiation. And, the, and the, it's a, it really happened. And the disciple who was going to get initiation, he asked the swami, but swami, don't mind, let me ask you. Vivekananda didn't have to go through all this. He uh, asked Ramakrishna, have you seen God? And Ramakrishna said, yes. And he showed Vivekananda God. So can't you sort of do that to me? <laughs> <laughs> and then the Swami replied, neither am I Ramakrishna nor are you Vivekananda. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one answer. But you're right. Did you hear what the Swami uh, read out before we started the talk? about the Guru. It cannot come through books. It's only one illumined soul which can light the lamp of illumination. The quickening impulse comes from another spiritual soul. That's what the Guru does. And in an extreme case, it's like Ramakrishna. In the highest case, where it, it does not need a lecture. It does not need uh, even mantra diksha. It does not need meditation. If Ramakrishna wants, if Jesus wants, if Krishna wants, he give us liberation just like that. It can, it, they can do it. But, again you will see, why didn't Ramakrishna do it for everybody? Even when he did it for Narain, what was Narain's reaction? He was terrified. He ran for his life. <laughs> Arjuna in the Gita asks Krishna, I've heard 10 chapters of teaching. In the 11th chapter he asks, can I see it? If you think, can I see it? And he prays to see the divine form of Krishna. No, I've got all the theory. Chapter 1 to chapter 10. Chapter 11 of the Gita, Arjuna asks this. And Krishna readily agrees. Yes, of course. I'll give you the divine sight. Divyam dadami tejakshu. I'll give you the divine sight by which you can see my universal form. And he does show Arjuna universal form. It's, it's, a, it's magnificent poetry where it's described. The universal form of of. Uh, Krishna, the Vishwarupa Darshan. Oppenheimer, when he saw the first explosion of the atom bomb here, the test, the mushroom cloud rising in the light there, he chanted from the 11th chapter of the Gita, he was a Sanskrit scholar, he chanted, I come with the light of a thousand suns, I come the destroyer of worlds. Very good. But what was the result? What happened to Arjuna? He was terrified. He was terrified. It doesn't work or that, that way. Unless the person is ready to receive, God out of infinite compassion can give it, but can we hold it? It's like a little bulb with a million volts surging through it. Just blow. There was one uh, Vaikuntanath Sanyal. You know, on 1st January 1886, the year Ramakrishna passed away, on the 1st of January, Sri Ramakrishna actually gave, what he had given Narain Vivekananda, he actually gave it to one and all, whoever came to him for a period of some, uh, maybe an hour or so. People came and bowed down to him and he gave them, Chaitanya Hope, may you be illumined. And they were illumined at that point. 
they got an experience. First January. In Calcutta, it is celebrated as Kalpataru Day, the wish-fulfilling tree. That when Ramakrishna became the wish-fulfilling tree for just a short span of time. And all got at least very high spiritual experiences. All of them, straight away. The moment they touched his feet and he, he said, may you be illumined. But what was the result? Vaikuntanath Sanyal, a householder disciple, he reminisces. Somebody asked him, what did you experience when Ramakrishna touched you? And he said on that day, 1st of January 1886, he said, immediately I saw Ramakrishna everywhere, stretching, he, the description is, is stark, stretching from the sky to the earth, wherever I looked, I saw only Ramakrishna. And my heart was overflowing with ecstasy, with bliss, the world faded away from my sight. And then, he said, I sort of somehow tottered home. And it did not go away. Everywhere I just experienced Ramakrishna. The food I was eating, people around me, everything. And he says, on the third day, no sleep. No sleep. Everywhere, blazing forth, unmistakable. And he says, then on the third day, I got scared. He said, I cannot carry on with my life, my business, my family, and I'll go mad. I'll just go mad this way. And he says, I prayed, Lord, what you have given, please take it back. The moment he prayed it, it faded, faded away. He asked for it. So the moment he prayed that, take it away, it faded away. And then he says, very touchingly, that was 40 years ago. He says, now 40 years later, Ramakrishna passed away and his life continued ups and downs. He said, I now think, why did I pray like that? What have I gained? I should have remained like that. What would have happened? I would have gone mad. I would have died maybe. It's perfectly all right. Dwelling in the vision of truth if the body drops away, fine. Why couldn't I bear it? And he says, all these years, what has sustained me was the memory of those three days. Once in a while I think about that and, and I get the joy and the peace and that's what has sustained me. So yes, um, that's what happens. It's difficult to hold on to. The rest of us, we have to work our way up to it. You see, the truth is, according to Ashtavakra, the truth is completely and totally, fully available to us right now, at this moment. It's right now, literally, believe me, it's available to us. Without, It's not even hidden. Vivekananda called it the open secret. Right now, it's available to us. All our sadhana, spiritual practice, is just cleansing the mirror. Vivekananda says the only thing that you can do is polish the mirror. That's what we are doing. Question? You mentioned about abiding in consciousness, yes. but assuming someone abides in consciousness, okay, you will also don't need karma, thinking, and all of those things. So isn't it true that you have to achieve that level to even to abide in consciousness just by thinking about it, I may not be able to achieve in this life. Is that true or false, would I say? Abiding in consciousness. Don't be misled by the language. You know, when Ashtavakra asks us to abide in consciousness, it's basically he's asking the wave to abide in water. He's asking the ornament to abide in gold and the furniture, the wooden furniture to abide in wood. You will see it's already wood. It's already gold. The wave is already water. Precisely. Abiding in consciousness is just to be free of the wrong notion that I am not consciousness. That I am... Body, mind, we you know what we think about ourselves right now, to be honest. We think about ourselves and we behave it that way too. We think that we are bodies and minds with consciousness. What Ashtavakram is pointing out, know for certain that you are consciousness experiencing a body, mind. That nice saying, we think we are human beings in search of a spiritual experience. The truth is we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Ashtavakra is uncompromising. You just have to know it. You say, no, should I, what about lifelong practices? You can do that. Have fun. Do lifelong practices. Right? He 
He's pointing out a basic truth. Whether you practice or not, you are Brahman. So I will not practice. I will not meditate. I will not pray. Then you will suffer. The solution, the solution to your question is this. If you want a straight answer, the straight answer is this. Know that you are Brahman, existence, consciousness, bliss. Knowing that you are Brahman, this per person that you are aware of now, this person, this body, this mind, this life, what's the best use? To, 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 be, a, to be a completely <laughs> spiritual person. Is it that I have realized I am Brahman? Now I need to go to Wall Street to make a million. <laughs> that will never come. The moment you realize that you are Brahman, the only thing that will remain is the rest of this life, the game of this life, as long as it appears to you. You will use it to the best of... You'll either remain immersed in Brahman, or your actions will always be for the benefit of others. You'll be full of love, of service, of sacrifice. Complete feeling of oneness with nature and with everybody around you. Try to be established in pure consciousness, you will immediately feel oneness with everybody. And your every action, your every thought and every word that you utter will reflect that reality within. You see, Vivekananda, the simple definition of religion, religion is the manifestation of the divinity already within us. You can exactly see. In that little definition, everything is answered. Realize that you are Brahman and then manifest it. Oh, I can't manifest, I keep forgetting. Meditate upon it. You will not forget. My heart is dry. Love and uh, surrender to God. It will help you to manifest the truth much better. Look at Vivekananda. This simple, you know, his, his powerful statement. My mission in life can be put in a few words. It is to preach unto humanity their inner divinity and how to make it manifest in every movement of life. Inner divinity Abide in pure consciousness. Manifest in every movement of your li life. Let your actions, your thoughts and your words reflect the fact that you are Brahman, that you are free, you are a Jivan Mukta. Live like that. And say, ah, but I am not that yet. Ashtavakra says, you are that. You cannot be anything else. What you think that you are. Yes. Question. Just gentlemen, and then we go there. And then we should go to the other side of the room too. Yeah. Yeah. How does empathy and compassion work with this overall consciousness? What's the point of one wave having empathy for another wave? Because which are all water anyway. Right. So it's not empathy of one for the other. It's the empathy that is the natural consequence of oneness. It's not a choice that this hand makes a choice to be kind to this hand. No. We are one. Hence, your interests are my interests. Your suffering is my suffering. It's an ethic based on oneness. There's an ethics based on duality. The, the thought of empathy comes, you're looking at it from a dualistic point of view. I am one person, you are one person. I have to be empathic with you. I have to understand your feelings. I have to feel what you're feeling. On the other hand, if I'm the one consciousness manifest as this and as that, then I'm not one person empathizing with you. There's no choice there. In fact, oneness and empathy, they will, they'll be the natural consequence of this Advaitic knowledge. In the dualistic worldview, it can be empathy, it can be lack of empathy. In the Advaitic world, worldview, lack of empathy does not make any sense. Since we are one, manif that knowledge manifested through this body's behavior will automatically reflect in empathy for everybody. It's not a new thing that I'll have to practice. In a dualistic worldview, hatred is possible. And hatred has to be overcome by love. In a non-dualistic worldview, how can there be hatred? How can one hand hate, uh, hate the other? You say that, but then how can one hand love the other? One hand cannot love the other in a dualistic way. But one hand can feel one oneness with the other. In the deepest sense, what is empathy but oneness? Empathy means with, with the other, feeling the emotion of the other. Yeah. 
we go to the back of the room and then we'll go to the other side. Namaste Swamiji, it was a wonderful lecture. Uh, my, uh, my question is this, now if we say that all is Brahman, yes. if, if everything around is Brahman, doesn't that logically mean that there is no such thing as Brahman? Why? Because let's, uh, let's assume you are, let's take the ocean. Yeah. Okay. Let's take the ocean without fish or, or anything in it. Yes. Okay. Now, from the point of view of the ocean, yeah. it, on, it will only think that it is the ocean if there is something to differentiate the ocean from something else. Yes. The, uh, the atmosphere, the yes. land outside. Yes. Now, if I take the same argument to Brahman. Yes. The only reason we are all seeking Brahman is because we are different from it. If we were Brahman itself, I mean, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, that was going to be the second point of my question. So if everything is Brahman, if, if everything is something, that something doesn't exist essentially. No, it's like saying all the waves are water, therefore water doesn't exist. Yes, but 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 in but but even in that you are making case, a distinction between understanding its existence in contrast to something else and its actual existence. If the ocean could not understand itself as an ocean in contrast to the sky, for example, it would not think of itself as an ocean. You're right, but would it cease to be the ocean? No. It no. Should, should, no. Your understanding depends on the mind, and the mind functions in duality. You're right. We feel ourselves to be different from Brahman, hence we seek it. Correct. One must be honest about what we are, what we, what we feel. It's like the wave which does not know it is water. And then the wave is educated into knowing that it is water. Immediately it feels one with all other waves. Right? That's all. With the, the sense of difference is erased. Oneness ensues. The... A recognition of oneness comes about. Two questions on that side. I see a lady who's raising her hand and the gentleman there. And then we'll stop because we have run out of time. Hariyam Swamiji, Pranam. Uh, I have two questions. One is how a person can find uh, the purpose of his or her own life. And the second is a social person like me or others. Uh, how one can practice a spiritual life in our spiritual practice in our day-to-day -day life. Okay. Thank you, Swamiji. Purpose of life, straightforward. As Vivekananda said, the purpose of life is God-realization. If you ask Ashtavakra, what's the purpose of life? It's to realize that you are Brahman. You say, no, my purpose is to get the school kids to school and back sa safely. My purpose is to pay, pay up the mortgage on my house. My purpose is to uh, at least not get fired from my job. My purpose is to save enough for a rainy day. My purpose is this, that, to see, catch the latest movie from Hollywood. These are all my purposes. But I'll ask you, what are all these purposes meant for? They're all meant to make you happy. You're seeking satisfaction and peace. It's because these pursuits do not work that we ultimately turn to spiritual life. To prayer and love and meditation and knowledge. All of these pursuits, they come because... We are not satisfied with the, this, this whole range of worldly pursuits. Ultimately, it is all for peace and happiness. What did Ashtavakra say in that, that verse? Separating yourself from the body and mind, you see yourself, you abide in pure consciousness. Right now, you will attain permanent joy and, and peace. Sukhi Shanta. That's what we are seeking. You seek it wisely we will call you spiritual you seek seek it other wisely it's just called life and living life so the purpose of life is actually all of whether we recognize it or not you recognize it and consciously pursue it you end up in the vedanta society listening to talks on ashtavakra you don't recognize it then you're just having a, a fun and a nice uh, weekend uh, somewhere out there but all of us are pursuing the same goal in life. Pursue it wisely. It's quicker that way, less suffering that way. Yeah. And then can we, as a person in society, can we, how can we practice this? Remember, Janaka was very much in society. He was, he was a monarch and a, 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 he had an empire to run. 
Krishna was a, was a prince and a general. He, he had a war to fight. They were, these were immensely practical men. If this Vedanta was something impractical, they wouldn't give it a second thought. They had no time for, uh, for subtleties and, and you know, sophistries. It is meant for people who are busy. All right. Question there. Yes. And did, but somebody asking a question there, back there? No? Then somebody Same here? Way. Okay, here. That's the last question. We run out of time. Hello, Swamiji. Um, my question is, is uh, fairly simple. I would like to know, well, I heard you speak earlier about knowing that we are Brahman. Yes. And I would like to know the difference between knowing, believing, and thinking that we're Brahman. Very good question. Suppose I sit and think, I am Shiva. I'm thinking that. An actor who acts like Shiva on, on stage, you know, in, in a religious play, he is acting. He thinks, he tries to simulate being Shiva. He's still that actor. He knows that he is so-and-so an actor. So what does he know and what is he, what is he acting as? Two different things. He knows I am an actor. That knowledge is uns unshakable. And he's ma make believe that he, he's doing that, that as acting as Shiva. So that's a superimposition. As long as he acts like that, he looks like Shiva, he talks like Shiva and whatever, he dances like Shiva and whatnot. But all the time he knows I'm not Shiva, I, I'm an actor. So what you, what you think, what you believe is different and what you know is different. Right now, we may uh, have heard or studied Vedanta and we come to believe in it. It sounds pretty logical, pretty, pretty rational. I think it's right. If I ask you, do you know that you are Brahman? Do you believe that you are Brahman? I believe. I, I am, I'm, I'm sort of convinced that I am I'm Brahman, but I don't know it yet. If you believe it, you may believe something else also after some time. A more convincing argument comes along, you may change your belief also. But if you know something, one master put it this way, um, again in, in Haridwar. He was saying, a person who has never seen milk, but has studied about it, he may get confused. He has studied that milk is something that it's white and it's sweet and it comes from cows. And then somebody comes along and tells him, you know what milk is? Yeah, it's white and it's a liquid and it's sweet and it comes from cows. And that person says, mischievously, that's only partially right, you know? It's only when it comes from white cows that it is white. But when it comes from brown cows, it's brown. It comes from red cows, it's red. And from black cows, it's black. And then this person gets confused. He thinks that it sounds pretty logical. Maybe my teacher just taught me a little bit of the truth and not the rest of it. Quite possible. But the person who knows what milk is, is I'm not bothered with your logic. Why should a black cow give white milk? It just does. I know it. it. I know it. Because I know what milk is. It's like staring at the sun. If somebody tells you there's no such thing as a sun, it's nothing to you. It's clear to you. You know it then. So no knowledge and belief are two different things. You might say, I believe there is some money in your pocket. I believe. And you will say, I know there is some money in my pocket. There's a difference. It's a conjecture for me. It's knowledge for you. It's a debate in philosophy. You know? it, it's an issue in philosophy. When does belief become knowledge? Yeah. All right, then. That's it. <laughs> Let me do one more chant in the end. Om Purnamadav Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vishishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamaste Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.